Welcome everybody to a question and answer session on radar remote sensing. My name is Brock Blevins, training coordinator for the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. This session is also called For Everything You Always Want to Know About SAR. So this session is created in partnership with Franz Meyer, and we'll do some introductions here in just a little bit. But just as an introduction to the training itself, in recent years, Earth Observation has had uh, seen an increase in the availability and application of SAR data for a variety of applications. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program of NASA had, has had a series of online webinars, one on an introduction two years ago, a four-part series offered in English and Spanish, and another one last year uh, and advanced on how to access and process SAR data for a variety of applications. So we wanted to provide this question and answer session in English right now and then later on today in Spanish for a, a two hour question and answer period to provide you with an opportunity to ask any further questions. So I'm going to first uh, start to introduce our panel of experts here today. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Erica Podest. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Erica Podest. I'm a scientist in the Earth Science Division at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and my expertise is in uh, radar remote sensing. And I have been the instructor for RSET's two SAR sessions, the introductory one and the advanced one, 2017-2018. Um, I'm glad to be here today. Franz Meyer, um, I'm at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm also the chief scientist of the Alaska Satellite Facility. It's one of the data centers that you may have been using uh, SAR, SAR data sets from before. Um, um, I'm, my background is in radar remote sensing, but also in, um, in capacity building in SAR. Um, as part of this, we actually have a, a number of upcoming trainings. Um, so we'll be uh, training in Ecuador and in Colombia later, later this year. And we have done trainings last year in Africa and in Bangladesh. Um, so um, I'm, I hope the, uh, so the questions that you will ask us today will also inform us um, to be better at future SAR trainings. It would sort of help us identify the sticky sticky points for SAR. Um, I'm also on the NISA science team. Um, we have um, at least two more people that are related to NISA on the panel. Um, so if you have questions re related to the upcoming NISA mission, please uh, don't be shy to ask you, asking any of these questions uh, from us. So on. We also have Paul Rosen here today. Hi, everybody. Paul Rosen. I'm here in India uh, attending a NISAR uh, meeting. I'm the project scientist for NISAR at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And my background is in radar remote sensing and for both uh, Earth and the planets. And I'm happy to be here and answer any of your questions. This is Eric Fielding. I'm a geophysicist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I use uh, SOAR data primarily to study earthquakes and landslides, but also some other uh, geophysical processes. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. I am Eric Anderson from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, I also serve as the NASA Severe Associate Chief Scientist. Um, I have a background also in capacity building, um, translating, um, international development challenges into um, solutions that satellites can provide. Um, and I have uh, a bit of training experience in English and in Spanish um, on, on how to use um, remote sensing and GIS for uh, disaster management and environmental monitoring. I will allow any one of the panelists to uh, go ahead and start with question one. Well, since Franz is busy typing in the answer to question two, uh, this is Paul Rose, and I can uh, read question one and my written answer, and then we can uh, talk about it more if there's further follow-up. So question number one is, the critical baseline for interferometry is dependent on the bandwidth of the system, 
but higher bandwidth would mean more data rate and development challenges. In principle, can we also change the center frequency of the system in the repeat measurement of the area rather than keeping a large bandwidth? If yes, then what are the challenges associated with it? And has it been implemented in any mission, current or future? So uh, the answer I typed in right now is yes. Uh, in, in that uh, a longer wavelength uh, means a longer critical baseline uh, for a fixed range bandwidth or range resolution. Uh, however, a longer wavelength typically means a larger antenna in the elevation direction, and larger antennas usually mean uh, higher cost. So uh, for in terms of being implemented in any mission, it turns out that NISAR and ALOS, which are L-band systems, uh, 24 centimeter wavelength systems, uh, can operate with a very large critical baseline, uh, somewhere on the order of 20 kilometers, in some cases, with a very modest bandwidth. And that allows us to get good interferometric performance um, for the mission. We can control the baseline well with the system and keep the correlation high uh, because the critical baseline is so much larger than our actual baseline. In the NISAR case, uh, we have a very large antenna. It's actually a 12 meter diameter circular reflector that we're using. Uh, it is a challenge to build. There's a nine meter boom associated with it. It's a 12 meter mesh reflector that has to deploy in space. Um, and there's quite a bit of complexity and cost associated with it. Although for that size aperture, we believe the NISAR costs are uh, much lower than they would be if we tried to build the same thing using the conventional flat panel planar phased array technology. So just a few more words about uh, the critical baseline and resolution and wavelength, uh, which I actually bears on the answer to question number two. Uh, I would say that you can think of a resolution element in a SAR image on the ground, the resolution element as effectively being a little antenna. Uh, you illuminate with the radar the ground, and that energy that scatters off of the ground re-radiates back towards the radar, and that's like a little antenna. And if you studied SAR in, in the RSET classes and elsewhere, you would know that antennas have a beam width that is proportional to the wavelength divided by the size of the antenna. And in this case, the size of the antenna that we're talking about is our little, is our resolution element. So that's the resolution. So you can see that the size of that little radiation pattern from the resolution element uh, is proportional to the wavelength divided by the, so the resolution. So the longer the wavelength, the larger that radiation pattern is. And that radiation pattern is proportional to the critical baseline. So you can see if you have finer resolution, you have a bigger critical baseline. And if you have longer wavelength, you have a critical baseline. So why it relates to question number two is a permanent scatterer or persistent scatterer is just like um, something that has very, very fine resolution. It's the only uh, element in a given resolution cell that has significant energy and it's very tightly constrained, so the resolution effectively of that pixel is much, much finer. And so you have a, essentially an infinitely large critical baseline, and you can see it no matter what the observation. Yeah, so thank you, Paul. And that leads uh, to question two. So uh, question two on our list, I'm not sure if you all see the list is could you please describe PSI, the PSI technique? PSI stands for Persistent Scatterer Interferometry. <clears throat> and the uh, question goes on to asking, is there a suitable 
a free software tool for processing PSI, for doing PSI processing. And so as as you may know from, from previous uh, training efforts, uh, one of the applications of SAR is looking at uh, the deformation of the surface. A very powerful tool is it's called um, SAR interferometry or INSAR. Um, <clears throat> and it's capable to um, measure the, uh, the deformation of the ground at the at fractions of a wavelength. And um, so typically uh, radar wavelengths are somewhere between roughly maybe one in 10 centimeters. And that shows you that through INSAR, you can uh, observe uh, surface deformations very accurately. Now, in many cases, because the technique is so powerful, we are trying to observe uh, um, surface deformation that are very small and that are developing very slowly over time. Um, deformations that go on at the, uh, say, millimeter to centimeter per year type of rate. Uh, this kind of deformation may be related to groundwater ex extraction under um, uh, urban environments. They may be related to seismic or so interseismic creep along fault lines and so on. So they are very small deformations that we still would like to extract. Um, <clears throat> in order to give um, um, the, the Earth enough time to deform enough so that we can measure it uh, with, uh, with the INSAR technique, we sometimes need to create interferograms that span very long times, uh, time scales. And the problem is that over these long times, a lot of the environment changes too much for the, for the measurement to still make sense. Uh, and there are some exceptions to that, and these are these PSI, these persistent scatterers. These are often point-like um, um, objects on the ground, uh, rocks, um, corners of buildings, um, you know, pieces of mostly man-made structure that can, that remain the same over very long time spans. And if we can extract their information, then we can use these particular scattering elements to um, measure the formation of very long times and, and with very high accuracy. And so these are these PSI. So long-term stable, mostly point-like scatterers. Um, the PSI technique uh, was really one of the first uh, methods that was out there to monitor deformation at the uh, centimeter to millimeter scale over long times. And it's particularly uh, used for uh, deformation in uh, sort of urbanized environments, um, deformation that relates to infrastructure installations, also like levees um, um, and uh, dams and so on. Um, and uh, they are usually not as popular for, for the for natural environments where the likelihood of having these these um, objects that that are very bright um, in the radar image and are stable over very long times are not uh, that likely to exist. Um, there are a lot of um, software packages out there that can do PSI processing. Many of them are not, not public domain. There are a few exceptions to that. The one popular one that I could think of right away is is called STAMPS. STAMPS stands for, and maybe Paul has to help me with this, Stanford Modified PS algorithm, I think. Uh, I pasted a link uh, to that, uh, to some information on that software package into the document. I also pasted another link into the document to a page called Radar Code. Radar Code is basically a web page that tries to curate all public domain um, SAR related software packages that are out there. Um, um, so, so stamps is one of the ones that are on the list. There are a few more of the ones that have developed more recently. Um, um, and you can go to that web page and find more information about all of these uh, packages and potentially download uh, the, the source code and, and try to work with them. Um, Paul, do you know of any other PSI public domain tools that I uh, can't recall right now? Um, uh, the ICE package that we're building for NISAR, uh, I believe, has some workflows that are prototypes. I don't think they're available yet, but I, they will be. They are certainly working on it. So maybe in another six months or so. ICE is spelled I-S-C-E. Yes. And if you're working on, on fairly uh, limited extent areas, so if you're sort of, say, if you're interested in understanding the deformation of a bridge in, in your hometown, there is a software package that's called SARPROS, um, S-A-R, P 
P-R-O-Z. Um, <clears throat> the, the software is not necessarily free for like commercial use, but you might be able to get a license for like academic use and science use from um, the PI of that project, uh, which is Daniele Perisin, um, who now is at a university in Italy. Paul, do you have anything to add to the question? Nope, you did a great job. Um, I could, uh, I'm working on three. Do you want to talk to it right now? I can. So um, the question is, how is the velocity of the sensor platform utilized to get a higher resolution? Um, Actually, I wanted to know how specifically it's utilized for better spatial resolution in a specific mode. So um, for those of you who have studied standard SAR theory, you'll know that the resolution in the long track dimension is basically just the antenna length divided by two. So it doesn't matter what the velocity is. And in fact, the velocity will affect the Doppler bandwidth. The higher the velocity, the higher the Doppler bandwidth. But that just means the time resolution is finer. And since the velocity is faster, um, the spatial resolution would be the same. So it, it, what really matters is how, uh, what the spatial extent at a given point on the ground is in the radar beam. And the radar beam width is not determined by the velocity, it's determined by uh, the size of the antenna and the wavelength. So uh, trying to think in spotlight mode, the resolution is also determined by the illumination extent, not the velocity. I'm not sure I can think of any specific radar modality where the velocity matters. Can you, Franz? Um, um, so th the velocity of the um, the sensor itself uh, only matters in the sense of it dictates the um, pulse repetition frequency that needs to be used by the um, by the system to sample the data correctly. It is more the yeah. beam width of the antenna that uh, that defines the resolution and the fact that the antenna is moving. So the velocity, in the sense that it provides motion to the platform, is is essential. Well, yes and no. I mean, you can do the point and click method, point and shoot method, with no real velocity, <laughs> and still get a synthetic aperture. So the question four was uh, reads how to minimize the effect of wave in flood or water map. So um, I found that Sentinel One seems to be affected by the wind by windy waves, um, uh, especially when there are larger water water bodies, and this reduces the accuracy of water masking or water detection using SAR data. Is there a better approach to improve flood mapping or water masking? So what the uh, person that's asking this question is talking about is that um, depending on polarization, the um, the brightness or the, the response of uh, a certain water body to uh, to the SAR is is strongly dependent on um, a wind that may blow over waters or, or any other ripples that may happen on the water. So one of the things that SAR is good at seeing is roughness, is surface roughness. And if you have wind blowing over a water surface, the wind interacting with the water surface causes um, so-called capillary waves, uh, surface waves that increase the roughness of that surface and therefore makes uh, water appear much brighter um, uh, than it would appear if there was no wind. Um, in terms of the application, when uh, people attempt to do things like flood mapping or water detection and water masking, the approach usually is that um, one assumes that water bodies are much darker um, than the surrounding environment because in the absence of wind, water is very smooth, is a very um, specular reflector and looks very dark in, in SAR scenes. 
this is not true anymore uh, when significant wind comes into play. This increases the uh, rate of cross-section of water and makes it harder to discern from uh, the uh, surrounding environment. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so this is true uh, for SAR in general, but it, the, the effect of roughness on the SAR response depends strongly on polarization. Um, for instance, um, Sentinel-1, depending on whether you work over land or over water, over land areas, it typically provides uh, two polarizations. One of them is the so-called uh, co-polarized signal, VV, where the signal is transmitted by the satellite in vertical polarization and is also received uh, in vertical polarization, where the, the component of the signal that was um, uh, sent back in vertical polarization is rece received. In, in addition to that VV signal, um, Sentinel-1 also typically provides a second polarization, which is VH. Uh, this is the component of the signal that was transmitted in vertical polarization, but received in horizontal polarization. It turns out, uh, if you have both of these polarizations available, it turns out the cross-pole term, this VH term, is much less sensitive to wind and um, and the brightness on water will go up uh, much less slowly um, uh, with increase of wind than for the VV signal. So one workaround is to work instead of the VV data set to work off of the VH data set for water detection uh, and flood mapping during windy conditions. Um, other approaches that you can use uh, is to uh, work off of um, polarization ratios like uh, VVVH uh, ratios to um, improve the uh, detection of water surfaces. But one of the easiest ways is to just switch from the VV uh, to the VH channel. And it also strongly depends on the radar wavelength. This is true, yes. So the longer the wavelength, the less the sensitivity. This question, I think, was specifically directed at Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 uh, operates at C-band, which is a wavelength roughly at about five centimeters uh, scale. Um, um, future missions like um, NISAR, working at L-band, which is about a 25 centimeter scale, uh, will have will be less affected by wind effects. You meant uh, up here where I've highlighted, you meant more slowly, not less slowly, right? Brightness of the water. Yes. Okay. Question five. Um, who's going to take that on? Uh, Erica, or do we have a UAV SAR person on who's been doing this for a while? Otherwise, I can't give it a first crack. All I know is what Sakar is doing. Yes. So let's get started with this. Erica, if you have any additional information, please chime in. Um, sure. So the question five is, is it possible to rely on radar images to classify agricultural crops with good accuracy, and if possible, can you give some links to explain more? Um, so there's some answers that are being typed in already. Let me uh, tell you real quick that there are methods, especially, um, um, so overall, if you look at, uh, at vegetated environments, um, the, the, uh, the more success for detecting agriculture and classifying agriculture will come with future missions such as NISAR that operate at longer wavelength, uh, like L-band. Um, there's some things you can also do with C-band, but generally um, characterizing uh, vegetation, um, the, the, the performance of radar to characterize vegetation, um, especially if it's more substantial vegetation, will improve um, as with the lengthening of the wavelength. So a C-band sensor like Sentinel-1, um, mostly because its penetration into vegetation is limited, will be less capable of um, classifying vegetation than an L-band sensor 
that has uh, more penetration capabilities. There are some methods still to um, use radar, especially time series of radar data sets. So, so uh, data sets that were acquired throughout the growth season, for instance, to at, at the very least get at the area where agriculture growth or agricultural activities are uh, happening. Um, one method for that is the uh, coefficient of variance, um, which basically uses the fact that through a growth se season, the rate of cross section in agricultural environments uh, changes dramatically. No vegetation to the growth of vegetation to the harvest, um, which makes it reasonably straightforward using SAR once you have a time series of data to detect these um, the agricultural fields. Um, then from their signature, both in time and in uh, sort of the polarimetric information, you can do more uh, toward um, classification of crops. There's a little bit of work out there that we can track down. I don't have a link handy, but um, there's a paper by Paul Sikera that we can, and his team that we can uh, paste in here that has been using um, data from L-band and C-band to try to get to the detection of agriculture and to a classification of different crops. Um, and I can track down that link while maybe Erica is talking about RSET trainings. Sure. So, um, I, and adding to what Franz just said, uh, remember that radar is sensitive to structure and to water content. Um, so, an optical is sensitive to the uh, the chemical composition of your plants. So it's two different measurements and with SAR you can identify different types of crops as long as they're structurally different and the, the structure of the crop will change throughout the growing season. So if you have time series uh, you can uh, better identify your crops. Uh, if you have polarimetric information uh, you can um, it helps to identify different types of crops. And there are several publications out there. There was an RSET training specifically on this, the last one that was done, the Advanced uh, SAR RSET training in 2018. Uh, there was, I believe it was the second one in the four-part webinar series. Uh, it was focused on uh, SAR for agriculture, um, so specifically identifying different types of crops and also looking at soil moisture. And that one was done by Dr. Heather McNairn from Agriculture Canada. And uh, she used radar set, which is C-band. So C-band, uh, again, uh, the, the wavelength will determine the amount of penetration of the signal through the canopy. And C-band has a shorter wavelength than L-band. So, um, for agriculture, uh, C-band will provide uh, adequate data depending on the size of your agricultural uh, crop. Um, and it'll, it'll provide adequate data in order to be able to, um, to differentiate different types of crops based on their structure. And I can dig up a couple of papers to that talk about uh, classifying uh, crop types with radar, as well as we can put the link to the RSET uh, agricultural SAR training that we did, that specific webinar.
Well, I answered number nine. I can uh, go on to that one while people are thinking about the other questions. So number, question number nine is why does uh, NISAR L band have both hybrid, hybrid pole and full pole? So uh, of course you would think that if you have full pole, you should use it everywhere and uh, that would give you the most information you possibly can get. But as with every practical, um, practical system, there are limitations both on the uh, on the uh, performance of each of the modes of the radar and also uh, limitations on how much data we can get to the ground. So if you operate in full pole mode, you probably know you transmit one polarization and receive both, and then you change the polarization to an orthogonal component, so H to V or V to H, on the next pulse, and then receive both polarizations. And that means in order to get uh, images at the two polarizations that are properly sampled, uh, you have to pulse the radar at twice the rate you would otherwise. That means then that you have twice the data. So that's one factor. We have, for NISAR, we're trying to make global measurements on both the ascending and descending parts of the orbit over all land and ice surfaces. So literally over 50% uh, of the time that the radar is orbiting, it is imaging something, land or ice, and even some oceans. So if we were to do that at full pole all the time, we would end up with uh, more data than we could even get to the ground with so much data. We're going to a hybrid pole, which has many of the characteristics of full pole data, not quite as not quite as rich, but pretty rich. It's more like a dual pole mode, and we don't have to uh, pulse the radar at double that rate. The other issue with our full pole mode is that um, because of this high rate, it has some noise properties called ambiguities, which are a little bit um, higher than one would like in the ideal case at certain parts of the swath. So um, for some applications, it's fine, but for others, it may not be quite as fine. So we've opted mostly to operate in dual pole modes with NISAR in order to get all the data to the ground and to have sort of uh, more optimal imaging performance. That said, also, the radar is mostly operated in the, the more traditional dual pole mode of transmitting horizontal and receiving horizontal and vertical polarization, so HHHB, uh, except over India. In India and the surrounding regions, uh, they have baseline a number of these compact pole hybrid type modes. And the reason that uh, most of the Earth is in the traditional polarization is because the scientists who are using the polarimetry um, have developed algorithms that are based on measurements over the years that have been done in those more traditional bases. So they feel that to do this globally in a hybrid mode would uh, mean they'd have to re redesign all those algorithms. Okay, thank you. Um, do we want to um, maybe go back to, so question seven, people have uh, started addressing question seven. Um, who wants to take the lead? Sure, so who has thanks. Uh, this is an exciting question for me, um, Franz, because you and I have, have partly addressed this in some of our other um, training uh, events. Um, so it looks like you and I both started typing. Um, I'd be happy for you to 
to, to walk us through um, uh, the rice case. Uh, and I can add in if, if you feel. No, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good comment on um, um, standing vegetation in flat water. Um, so this is ri irrigated rice is a very similar situation as, as a SAR um, instrument may see a, a wetland. Uh, just think about um, some different stages of um, growing irrigated rice. Um, we may start with um, open or bare soil. Once that field is irrigated, um, the, the, the SAR instrument may, sing, uh, may identify um, an inundated area or open water as single bounce. Um, as time passes, the vertical um, stalks or the rice may start to penetrate the water. Um, and the SAR instrument would see some vertical stalk, um, um, again, coming through a flat water. So we could have a bounce off of the vertical stalk and the, the, the open water which may look like double bounce. Um, and finally, as the rice um, crop matures, it'll grow, it'll, it'll uh, grow out some more leafy vegetation. And that would, that may no longer look like double bounce, but it may look more like volume scattering. Um, and right, I think uh, uh, someone added a, a note on SWAT, so I'll, I'll pass it off to, to another panelist. Yeah, I'm not a, this is Eric Fielding. Uh, I'm not an expert on SWAT. The uh, other NASA mission uh, that uh, JPL is building at the moment is called the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission, SWAT. And that mission will be using interferometry, uh, but to measure surface water elevation in rivers, lakes, and the ocean. Uh, they will be using single pass interferometry by having two antennas on the radar satellite to, to get the elevation uh, from the two antennas rather than uh, repeat pass interferometry that uh, Eric Anderson and, and others were, were discussing. Excellent. Um, the only thing about this question I wasn't sure about is if we actually read out the question. <laughs> so the question was due to interferometry, using interferometry to determine surface, uh, water surface elevation in rivers. And the uh, person asking the question says, he knows he can be done in wetlands using double bounds. And besides wetlands, what other type of vegetation can we obtain? Um, surface water ele elevation from inside from. And so SWAT can do it ideally globally. Other stocky uh, vegetation can potentially also been observed in, in similar ways. So rice was one of them. Um, it has been uh, shown to work in mangrove forests. So um, uh, especially if longer wavelength uh, data are available. And to that, um, thinking about stocky vegetation, um, Franz or Eric or anyone else, what do you think about um, stages of forest plantations? Um, right. So I just wanted to add that you can basically, you can detect inundated vegetation or water underneath vegetation under pretty much any type of vegetation as long as the signal can penetrate through the canopy, right? So it's not really the type of vegetation, it's the amount of biomass that's the limiting factor. So if you have a lot of biomass um, and that signal cannot penetrate through, then you don't have that double bounce um, scattering mechanism, um, even though you might have standing water underneath the vegetation. So we've seen um, inundated, well, or we can detect inundated vegetation that represents different types of um, vegetation types, you know. So, as uh, Eric mentioned, there could be um, rice uh, at different stages of growth. Uh, it could be mangroves. It could be tropical wetlands. It could be uh, just inundation that's 
flooded during a, 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 a specific event. So it's, it's the biomass that's the limiting factor. Excellent. Um, maybe uh, let's move on to question 10, which is um, perfect for Eric Anderson to answer. Please uh, reread the question also. Sure, thanks. Um, so uh, one of the participants is thanking, passing on thanks for the SAR handbook um, and asking if we plan on producing anything more like that. Um, so thank you for the for the feedback. Um, we'll have the link to that um, in the in the notes. Um, in fact, we are currently working with some of our new partners in Severe Amazonia uh, to look at co-producing new case studies. Um, and these will include, as the other chapters in our SAR handbook have included, um, a bit of theory um, that. Uh, transitions into tutorials with scripts, example data, and results. Um, I, I would say that this is the, the definition of these case studies is still underway. Provisionally, we're working on, on topics that are um, obvious priorities to the Amazonia, such as forest monitoring and forest change, um, as well as mangrove mapping um, that, that blends optical and SAR techniques. Um, I probably don't need to say that the Amazon region is very cloudy, so we, we anticipate quite a few um, opportunities to um, improve regular monitoring with blended optical and SAR approaches. And we're aiming towards early 2020 to make these, these materials available. I see um, um, Paul is working on question six. Uh, while you maybe get ready to answer question six, um, just one more note on the handbook. When you read through the, um, the document that hopefully you all see and will get access to, um, there's a link um, that I pasted in there to the handbook. So it's a free and open book. Um, um, it's also a living document, so hopefully uh, over time we'll actually expand um, the content of the book um, and update it as things change. And so if you follow that link, it leads you to a page where you can either download the entire book as a PDF, or if you're interested in only very particular applications, you can also decide to uh, download only um, uh, selected um, uh, sections of the book, uh, or you can uh, choose to download some of the quick guides. There's also quick guides, um, some information on what different um, wavelengths can see, uh, what sensors are available, where you can get sensor data from, and so on. Uh, those are also available um, on that link or through that link. Yeah, thank you, Franz. Um, I'm also getting um, some information from Africa Flores, who is the, one of the editors. Um, Franz was one of our, our authors um, in that in that book. Uh, there are some one-page reference, quick reference guides. Um, uh, about three currently. Um, our team is working on developing a few more of those. Um, again, as very practical, quick reference guides for SAR preprocessing, SAR vegetation indices. Um, different ways to access SAR, et cetera. Paul, I know you are still typing, but would you be ready answering question six? Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm effectively done. And uh, others can chime in who have done these things. Uh, um, so um, the question is, kindly explain the main differences between coherent and non-coherent decompositions in SAR polarimetry. And considering the application such as oil spill, which decomposition should be used for better results? So my answer is that coherent decompositions uh, mean basically that you are looking at the scattering matrix itself um, as opposed to a covariance matrix. And when you look at the scattering matrix, what you're trying to do is break it down into uh, other canonical scattering matrices that are 
uh, easily interpretable in terms of, uh, let's say, coherent targets or oriented things. So, for example, trihedral reflectors or dihedral reflectors, they have um, uh, well-defined scattering matrices that are diagonal, slightly rough surfaces also are that way. Um, or di, um, sorry, this, this should have said dipoles. Okay? Dipoles. Dipoles can be uh, that are oriented um, relative to the polarization of the waves can also have uh, very distinct signatures. Whereas uh, non-coherent decompositions rely on the, um, the covariance matrix. And they focus on the statistical properties of surfaces that are generally randomly oriented surfaces or perhaps a collection of these coherent scatterers that I mentioned before that are dense enough in the resolution cell that they sort of behave in a random fashion. So if you're going to be looking at oil spills or other natural surfaces like that, uh, that don't really have these coherently oriented scatterers in them. You should use non-coherent techniques. Franz, anybody else? No, that uh, that sounded good. In a way, um, I wonder, maybe that's, let's see, I'm trying to find the question right now. The, um, the coherent methods particularly use um, the full information amplitude and phase um, in 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 their in, in the analytics, while non-coherent methods often um, rely on amplitude only uh, or not on all of the phase information that's available in the covariance matrix. Um, that's perhaps true. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that way. If you have the information, you can read it. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So we had question ten. I um, I could talk briefly about question eleven um, with maybe from others. So this question relates to uh, so-called ROC curves. So the question is, could you please discuss ROC curves for interpretation in SAR and what are possible methodologies to apply it on SAR images for classification? Um, any related resource materials and softwares that uh, you may know of or that might be available? Um, and so that person is currently working on um, the assessment of oil spills, spatial extents, and uh, he or she is wishing to use ROC curves um, for this scenario. So, uh, so ROC, um, sp spelled um, ROC like C as in Charlie, uh, stands for receiving a receiver operating characteristic. And so it's a technical term that's used a lot uh, in when you try to describe the performance or the quality of a classifier you developed. So whether that's on image data or on other data sets, if uh, you develop some uh, approach to classify this data set into several subclasses, um, you can try to derive uh, a receiver operating char characteristic, which will describe to you the number of false alarms um, or the percentage of false alarms and the percentage of missed hits that you might incur um, for a given threshold. So it, it tells you how the performance of the classifier varies as you change the classification threshold. Um, they actually used quite a bit and quite extensively um, in SAR classification, uh, especially in, in, in when you use um, these more statistical classification methods, so methods that basically analyze the um, the uh, probability density function, the gray value histogram, if you want, of a SAR data set to classify um, uh, different things in an image. Um, if you wanted to create ROC curves to describe your classifier, 
in the performance of the classifier, uh, keep in mind that ideally you need to know both statistical properties of the image background, so the thing that you you are not interested in, and the statistical properties of the component that you want to detect. Um, so in your case, you would ideally want to know the statistical properties of the ocean background that is not covered in oil and contrast that to the to the um, uh, statistical properties of the the oil covered ocean and so once you know both of these parameters you can calculate those ROC curves and um, you can compare you can calculate the performance of your particular detection algorithm algorithm and you can contrast that and compare that to maybe other methods that are already available uh, in in literature, you can compare them analytically uh, side by side um, for the same kind of data set. So that's what it's uh, most useful for. Um, and um, I can. Um, so I we've done uh, a couple of papers where we used ROC curves to compare our methods to other methods. I can uh, paste uh, links uh, into the document. I don't know if anybody else on the panel knows more. Um, technical resources on using ROC curves for image classification. So please chime in if you have more stuff. So while I'm uh, finding uh, a link related to question 11, uh, does anybody want to take charge of question 12? It's PSI in SAR again. Uh, sure, already I, that's, a, that's a simple question, uh, question, simple enough question that I can answer. Um, the question 12, do we need to take any type of ground measurements for PSI at any step? And the answer is yes. Uh, PSI and, and all other types of INSAR measurements are always uh, relative measurements, and you need to have a ground, at least one ground control point within the area of your measurements if you want to uh, determine what the absolute uh, displacement of the of the ground surface is. So you, you always have to have some type of ground control or be able to just assume that you know some place is not moving within the scene. I think that uh, answers the question as it, as it was written. Excellent. <clears throat> um, so question 13, um, and that maybe we have to do collectively as well. The question 13 is, are there any alternatives to Pulsar Pro uh, since it's currently not available for download on the web? Um, for people not familiar with Pulsar Pro, um, um, we talked a little bit about SAR polarimetry before. Uh, SAR datasets usually provide information not only in one, one polarization, but in multiple polarizations. It's actually one of the um, big benefits of an active sensor like SAR, um, where we have full control over the polarization of the transmitted and the received signal, that we can actually use polarization to understand more of the environment than we can with a single uh, or non-polarized measurement. Um, there is a lot of theory out there on um, how to use polarization in SAR data to um, do image classification or do information mining in SAR data. And a lot of this uh, partly uh, fairly sophisticated theory is coded up in a software package that was released, uh, I think, by the European Space Agency uh, called Pulsar Pro. It's a free uh, software package um, that has been available now for a number of years. Um, and unfortunately, currently, and I'm not sure if that's still true, 
um, the tool is not available online, but as far as I know, the uh, the team is planning to uh, publish the next version of Pulsar Pro uh, fairly soon. In terms of alternatives, um, I personally am not aware of right now of uh, an alternative that has all the functionality that Pulsar Pro has offered um, in sort of the full breadth of um, mathematics that was in Pulsar Pro, but there's some there's some uh, polarimetric capabilities in a number of open source uh, tools. There's a little bit of uh, polarimetric information embedded in um, in ESA's uh, Sentinel-1 toolbox, or the SNAP uh, toolbox, SNAP, um, um, and I can track down the link where you can download SNAP. And Paul maybe can talk to a JPL effort, effort called Plant, I guess, which is being developed right now. Paul, can you say something about Plant? Well, Plant is mostly for polarimetrically related time series analysis, or at least multi-baseline. Uh, I don't know that it has all of the decompositions in it, but I, I have to be honest, I haven't used it myself. I'm sure it's not as complete as Pulsar Pro. But it is an open source tool, uh, and it is uh, expandable. And I think the authors, Marco Lavalle and his team, are interested in people contributing to it. So uh, I think it is probably a good way to go for uh, building a community Python-based. Uh, and Python with NumPy is extremely powerful uh, and relatively straightforward way of interacting with data. So I intend to check it out myself, but I have not yet. Yeah, so it's, it is true that it... Um, is a little bit thin on the market in terms of the full capabilities of Pulse Pulsar Pro right now, um, but we can follow up with um, Eric Potier and find out uh, what the, what the latest plans are for Pulsar Pro. My understanding was that it will become available again fairly soon. Do you know why it was removed? <clears throat> um, I seem to recall a uh, reason, but. I'm not sure enough about it to <laughs> to speculate right now. Okay. All right. And I pasted the uh, link to the Snap Toolbox um, into the document. Client is on GitHub. Just go to GitHub and type client. Okay, uh, question 14. Um, I don't really so the understand. Question. Yeah, let me read the question and let's see if we can get to the core of the question. I was wondering if we can use short time span star interferometry for detecting, I guess, systematic changes, line shaped changes in relative humidity. Is it feasible to use such a system as it can penetrate into cloudy conditions, which um, also predominated in front borders? So, uh, well, let me take a crack at that. So, I think the question is asking if you if you uh, have short time span interferometry where you know there's no surface deformation, can you use the phase signature in the interfer interfer interferogram to say something about what's going on in the atmosphere, um, especially uh, uh, regular features like a linear front, storm front or something. Since it penetrates clouds, you're looking at, uh, you're looking at wet and dry tropospheric changes from one time to the next. The answer to that question is yes, you can look at it. Uh, you can certainly see features. We see 
uh, atmospheric turbulence, we see water vapor variability, we see uh, changes in the path length due to topographic effects, even in, in the dry troposphere. We see gravity waves propagating across um, mountain fronts and things like that. So there's a lot of atmospheric features, quite rich. Many people have proposed using interferograms in an operational way to uh, update um, weather models. Uh, so far, there hasn't really been sufficient data to do so. And because SAR systems tend to be uh, in, in any given spot, they don't sample the atmosphere very often, maybe once every week or every two weeks. Uh, really understanding the signature is, has been difficult. But I think it's a rich area for the future, and many people have proposed to, um, to use systems like Sentinel, which have quite regular acquisitions, and NISAR also global or at least regional scale acquisitions to uh, model these differential signals, integrate them over time, and, and put them in the context of weather models. Uh, this is Eric Fielding. I can add that uh, I know uh, a uh, geophysicist at uh, Caltech has been trying to study uh, ground deformation in uh, in Pakistan, uh, Western Pakistan, and one of the problems he has there is that there are these huge signals of the water vapor in uh, fronts that uh, overwhelm some of the interferograms that he's trying to analyze for the ground deformation. So there is clearly a very large signal from these uh, weather fronts, and uh, I. It, especially, it's very it's very clear in places where you have good uh, uh, ground conditions for INSAR, like uh, Pakistan. Thank you, Eric and Paul. Um, before we move on to the next question, I want to. Uh, there was a, an important update to the previous question about Pulsar Pro. Thank you, Nayara, for providing that input. Um, Pulsar Pro version 6 is actually available now again, and uh, Nayara pasted in the link uh, into the document. Um, so if you look later on through doc the document, you should find the link um, to the point where you can download um, Pulsar Pro version 6. So for question 15, um, I just, I'm not sure I have the answer to the question, but I do want to point out that uh, if I interpret the question right, it's uh, indicating that NISAR will create P-band images. I want to just clarify that NISAR has an L-band sensor, 24 centimeter wavelength, and an S-band sensor, which is around 9 centimeter wavelength. So P-band would be the biomass mission, which should be launching in roughly the same time frame. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, study evaluating biomass with a combination of X and L. I think uh, that would be the closest, I think, would be the GeoSAR um, airborne mission back in the 90s, I guess it was. That was X band and P e band. Um, a dual aperture interferometer, uh, the wing tips of a Gulf Stream jet. Both X band and P e band were two aperture interferometers. So that measured the height at X band and the height at P e band. X band seeing closer to the top of the canopy in forest and than seeing the ground uh, trunk interaction and thereby measuring both the, uh, the height of the forest and the structure of the forest. So I don't know if those data are available for general use, but uh, there certainly were a lot of data taken. 
GeoSAR was a single pass interferometry with two antennas. Correct. That's what I was saying clumsily. Thank you for clarifying. Um, maybe uh, we can jump forward to uh, question 19. Um, I think Eric Anderson had been working on an answer to that question. Was that you, Eric? Yes, um, and just to caveat that I'm not an agricultural expert, but um, it's maybe to expand on the earlier discussion about uh, double bounce um, in vegetation. Um, it, it seems like a lot of the, the research and, and operational uh, thinking around SAR for crops is focused on rice. Um, it's um, and rice being grown in cloudy areas. There are several reasons that can justify why focus on rice uh, for SAR. So um, earlier we were discussing the um, how backscatter can behave in response to the different growth stages of rice. Um, I pasted a, a link. I, I pasted a link to a, an open access paper um, that shows a graph of um, sort of some images of different growth stages of rice and how backscatter rises and falls with those um, stages. And one of the ways you can use that uh, knowledge of that trend is to, to classify um, areas that are um, single or double or even triple uh, rice crops. Um, and this is important for understanding um, um, potential yield um, or yield deficit, um, greenhouse gas emissions, because rice is one of the rice patties are a major source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's another good summary in the second paper uh, link that I provided, which should be open as well. Um, in addition to backscatter, others have looked at um, ratios of HH to VV polarization. Um, in response again to rice phenology. So it may not be an index in, in the sort of normalized difference vegetation index or indeed VI or NDWI uh, perspective, but nonetheless, it's a, um, a ratio. That, so you could kind of think of it as, a, as an index that does characterize um, phenology in rice. Um, and I, I'm sorry I can't add more on to different crop types, um, but I, I hope that's a, a useful start. Okay, thank you very much. That's exactly um, the graph there. Yeah, thanks for pulling that up. <laughs> Um, so maybe let's uh, move to question 21, um, and um, so 21 is about um, the effects of the ionosphere in SAR on SAR backscatter, and somebody has already typed something in. Who has typed already? That was me, Paul. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but, you know, I was just channeling you, Franz. You've done most of the work on this. You can read my answer and then that's it, if you want. No, no, go, 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 go ahead. Doesn't matter. So the question is, could you please explain the effect of the ionosphere in the SAR backscatter? And my answer is the ionosphere can rotate the polarization of the electromagnetic SAR signals it's called Faraday rotation. Uh, so it can lead to imagery that have amplitude variations unrelated to the surface backscatter level, uh, which potentially could lead to misinterpretation of the image. In addition, the ionosphere can have plasma structures at a fine scale, and that can lead to the bending, refractive bending, and differential delay of the radar signal. That also can lead to uh, characteristic amplitude and phase distortions uh, that can be quite pronounced at times and really create um, create quite a problem for interpreting images when it's uh, that pronounced. And I see France is adding more right now. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that yes, um, uh, these effects. So um, um, both the Faraday rotation effect, which which can um, change at least over time the uh, the signature of of a point on the ground, as well as the um, distortions that you sometimes see in images when there is small small scale variability of the ionosphere. Um, those typically are more pronounced uh, for for long wavelength uh, stars such as P band and L band, but they also can be observed at C band. Um, if any of you has worked on um, um, tracking methods, for instance, there's a lot of people that use um, C band radar right now to look at things like glacier motion. And there, what you often do is you um, um, track um, the movement of a certain piece of ground um, over time through several SAR images. And when you do that, you may see um, um, some artifacts in your tracking result that come from this um, distortion of the image that sometimes happens uh, due to the ionosphere. So these effects are more pronounced at P and L band, but they are um, there in certain regions of the globe, also in C band, and even have been observed at X band. Um, for um, in, so, so the effect is on the amplitude, but also on the phase. It's actually often more pronounced on the phase. Um, some of the future missions, such as NISAR, will actually um, try to correct um, ionospheric distortions for some of uh, the products that they provide. Uh, NISAR will provide mission processed uh, interferograms, for instance, and these interferograms will have a correction layer um, uh, that you can use to correct for uh, ionospheric phase artifacts, at least um, in, in, in these data sets. Yeah. So I think we skipped a couple of questions. Maybe uh, let's go to question 16. Um, and I'm going to give it a first stab and then maybe Paul and Eric and other people can chime in. Um, the question is, is there, what is the reason behind uh, banding and scalloping that sometimes uh, is observable in SAR images? And then also the question goes on to also ask about speckle removal from SAR images. So the first question is about scalloping, the second is about speckle, um, and the question is about do we have any, what is the most efficient method for speckle removal? Um, there's a lot of speckle filters out there, and the author of the question would like to know if there's a recommendation we have for maybe a, a best uh, approach for speckle removal. Um, let me talk about um, scalloping uh, first, or sort of banding uh, that sometimes you can see in SAR images. Um, so both the scalloping and, and some of the bandings that you sometimes see, they're mostly a property of what we would call a burst mode type uh, SAR data. So, so SAR data sets such as ScanSAR, uh, also the TOPS mode that is currently operated by Sentinel-1, they sometimes show both scalloping and, and banding effects. Um, scalloping is actually a very specific uh, artifact. Uh, that comes from the fact that in these burst mode um, operation modes, not every point on the ground receives the same amount of energy uh, from the sensor during imaging. And um, this causes originally uh, in the uncalibrated data set, the, uh, the different, different patches on the ground to have slightly different brightness. This uh, effect is corrected during uh, image calibration. There's a so-called antenna pattern correction applied, which, um, which um, corrects for these slight differences in brightness. And uh, so over most areas, this actually removes this variation of brightness. But what also happens at the same time is as in darker areas, the radar brightness is increased um, to have a, a flat image in the end. Uh, we also increase the noise that is contained in the data set at the same time. And if you have data sets of a fairly dark background, for instance, if you're working on ocean scenes, 
um, you then sometimes can see the noise floor, an elevated noise floor in parts where the the brightness of the uh, of the image had to be increased uh, to to end up with a calibrated uh, flat scene, and that's what often is referred to as scalloping. Um, very pronounced in Scansar, um, or most pronounced in Scansar, and mostly observable in places where the the radar cross section of this, the ground itself is fairly low, so that noise plays a measurable or has a measur measurable impact on the um, appearance of the of the scene. Uh, and Paul, if you have anything to add there, you can. Um, on banding, um, th that may be. There's a second um, artifact that can sometimes happen in these burst mode data sets uh, like Scansar and TOPS, where um, in order to increase the uh, swath width, the coverage of one scene, um, we use burst mode to illuminate several swaths at the same time. And when these different swaths are being put together, sometimes there are calibration artifacts where they don't fully line up. Um, at the at the seam of the burst, these effects um, should be rare um, as calibration um, techniques uh, improve. They shouldn't be as observable observable anymore right now as they were in the past. Um, Paul, do you have anything to add on scalloping and banding? Uh, the only thing I would add is for large area mosaics where you're putting together scenes from adjacent uh, radar tracks. You're looking at the scene from different angles, uh, maybe adjacent pixels, one from one image and one from another image, are are being seen from different angles, and the surface scatter characteristics differ at different angles. So sometimes there are unavoidable banding artifacts from uh, scene to scene in a large area mosaic. But probably they meant the question was more geared towards your answer. Your answer is fine. Um, so the second part of the question was about speckle filters, and um, so you say a most effective method for speckle removal. And I would have to punt on that question, uh, as the author correctly says. There, there's a whole a whole um, library of speckle filters uh, that you can pick from. I think the Optimal filter will depend a little bit on your scene and on your application. Um, I'm not sure if there's a one one filter that I would recommend that works for most. For a while, um, uh, speckle methods um, based on um, what do you call it? Um, uh, Non-local mean filters. So 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 filters that try to identify. Uh, image chips with similar content and average those together. They were fairly popular for a while. Uh, I'm not sure if that's still the case. So if you have single images, these uh, non-local mean filters seem to perform pretty well, but there are other methods that perform similarly. So I'm not sure if I have a favorite. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody else on the panel has a favorite. Right. Uh, this is Erica. I, I agree with you, Franz. I think it's... Uh, it's just a matter of trying out the different filters and it's going to depend on what you're trying to do. I personally uh, have found that applying a, a mean filter is is what I prefer just because I like to try to maintain the original statistics of the data as uh, as close as possible to what they originally were. So some of these filters I'm not really sure what's being applied and how much the the original data is changing. That's true. The advantage of something like the non-local means, though, is that it, it looks at the statistics um, and seems to be able to preserve features that most people would like to see preserved sort of intuitively. It's true, though, that you don't always know the output statistics from those applications. Yeah, I'm not sure if we have a really useful answer here, but <laughs> at least an honest one, I guess. Who wants to yeah. take on uh, question 
17 on soil salinity. Somebody already. So I put this in. Um, I can read it and and, and write, read my answer, and you can chime in. So the question is, can SAR data be used in mapping soil salinity? And is there a theoretical relationship between SAR and salinity? So my answer is that backscatter from soils is the result of a number of processes. There's surface roughness, so backscatter from the roughness. It's the stru structural property of the soil. Subsurface volume scattering, some of the signal goes in, scatters off of rocks and layers and things like that, comes back out and goes back to the radar. And then dielectric properties such as soil moisture, salinity, and the like. So, um, and then just the variability in the, in the kinds of things in the soil that would have different dielectric properties. So um, it's fairly difficult to tease salinity out from that. It's a fairly weak signal. And uh, in general, soil moisture seems to be the dominant separable signal, especially at L-band. Uh, you may have heard of the SMAP mission or the SMOS mission. Uh, these are using L-band to pull soil moisture out for soils. Um, the Aquarius mission you may have also heard about, that was measuring salinity of the ocean. And that was also at L-band using radiometer and radar backscatter. But in that case, um, the moisture content of the water is pretty well known since it is water. Uh, it's basically 100% water. So the, the remaining dielectric properties uh, that exist and can be estimated are more easily attributable to salinity. So I would say that um, the, the likelihood of being able to pull salinity out of soil is, uh, out of SAR is fairly low, but maybe others have better experience. Anybody, anything to add? Uh, this is Erica. So I agree with what Paul said, and there are some curves. There is a relationship between SAR and salinity. Uh, Ulabi, who has like the, the Bible of SAR, um, has some curves in there. I'd be happy to uh, take a, a, a PDF of them and, and post them here. But um, it, it would be fairly low uh, possibility of actually mapping salinity in soils because the moisture, the water content is going to dominate. Um, okay, um, thanks a lot. Um, if there's nothing to add, maybe we can jump to question 20. Um, so this was, let me see, so this was question 17. We already addressed uh, 19. We still have to work on 18. So maybe let's do 20. Uh, who, uh, who typed the answer already for 20? And please repeat the question. So the question was on, uh, my question pertains to the vertical line of sight uh, looking down on a heritage building. What is the yeah. smallest mm -hmm. SAR payload mm -hmm. that can be mounted to a UAV? So um, vertical line of sight looking down on a heritage yeah, building. Yeah, so I typed the answer uh, that uh, this is Eric Fielding. Uh, uh, SAR. Um, Payloads for UAVs are a very active area of development uh, by a number of groups. Um, but one key thing about SAR is that you have to transmit the radar uh, with a significant amount of power, and that requires uh, a large antenna and batteries. And uh, so, it, SAR uh, payloads are always much larger than optical payloads for uh, UAVs. 
uh, I think uh, some typical uh, numbers that I've heard are on the order of uh, uh, 20 to 100 kilograms. Depends on your application, of course. If yes. you're willing to fly very low, uh, yeah, if you just hover, hover over something with a drone, then you can probably get away with a smaller one. But for practical applications, you're right. It's, it's a good idea. Okay, excellent. Uh, so question 21 we've already addressed, which was the one on ionosphere. So maybe let's uh, jump to question 22 and probably we have to tag team this one. So the question is, um, do you have any plans to introduce a cloud computing system or to having lectures on big data processing machine learning analysis and taking advantage of open platforms such as Google Earth Engine. Um, that is a really uh, important and timely question. So as many of you uh, may know, SAR data is becoming more broadly available and also these data sets are getting um, continuously bigger in size. Um, so it's, um, SAR is uh, very quickly uh, approaching to be a big data problem. Um, and it has some benefits. Um, so we have regular sampling now, which allows us to do things with SAR that we couldn't do in the past. But it also comes with some problems. Um, these, it, it, it becomes more and more difficult for a regular end user to, to really take advantage of all of that information, given the compute technology that's needed uh, and the storage space that's needed to work with these data effectively. Um, and so the question, the answer is yes, uh, I think at least in the NAS world, we've been thinking about um, um, cloud-based uh, compute resor resources for quite some time. There are teams uh, both at JPL and at the ASF uh, data center that are working on um, cloud-based uh, management of data, but also cloud-based computing of data quite extensively. Um, ISAR's uh, data system will actually very likely reside in the cloud and has been designed to uh, be able to run effectively in both cost effectively and, and computationally effectively in cloud systems such, such as the AWS Amazon Web Services Cloud. We've also started prototyping systems that allow users to come in and try to do the analysis in a cloud-based environment um, um, totally touting our own horn here a little bit. We've developed a thing that's called the Open SAR Lab. This is something that we currently are testing and scoping with a, a selected set of beta testers. Um, mostly we try to figure out whether it's, of, whether the functionality is useful, you know, and what the cost implications are, and also making sure that the environment is secure so that nobody can use the environment to either attack other scientists or do harm to uh, the data centers or harm to anybody else with. So, so we're working on that right now. I pasted a link to the environment into, uh, into the, uh, no, uh, this little uh, um, document and you can contact me if you want to know more about this lab and if you want to sign up. Um, other activities are going on at JPL. Maybe Paul can talk to that. And there is also uh, increased usage of Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine has um, ingested or is ingesting uh, Sentinel-1 uh, data um, into, into the environment. And there is a growing community that is using Google Earth Engine to do analysis also on SAR data. And maybe somebody from the Severe team can talk about um, support that the community is providing to people that like Google Earth Engine. So maybe Paul and Eric. Well, I can uh, comment on um, uh, well, let's see. I guess we we do give a um, SAR 
INSAR class at a place called UNAVCO every summer uh, that is being developed using uh, a methodology called Jupyter Notebooks, similar to what uh, Franz has implemented in his OpenSAR lab paradigm, which by the way is really quite great. Um, ours is not yet cloud uh, enabled, however, we could take all of our Jupyter Notebooks as designed and uh, port them to something like OpenSAR Lab and it would be instantly usable. So I think um, within the next year or so, it will be uh, cloud enabled. And I think both Franz and I believe that the future is these kinds of cloud enabled systems where you can take your tools to the cloud where the data reside. There's another development uh, that is also being uh, done between ESA and NASA in the, in, the data, in the data center development area. It's called MAP, uh, M-A-A-P, the multi-analysis multi platform or something like that. I can't remember what the acronym stands for. But in any case, this one is geared for the data from the NISAR mission, the biomass mission, which again will be launching and operating roughly the same time frame, and data from the JEDI um, space station based LIDAR, which is already in orbit. And the idea with this platform, it, again, is to provide tools, not just for processing, but even algorithm development uh, on the cloud, co-located with the data. They've had some prototype uh, demonstrations already. They have, a, I think, a two or three year development schedule. Uh, they're focusing on ecosystems, biomass estimation, disturbance estimation, and, uh, and related topics. So those, that should be a publicly available tool, I guess, within a year or so. And, and uh, this yeah. is Franz one more time. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to mention something real quick while we talked about Paul mentioned ESA. Um, ESA has an, um, an ongoing uh, effort also available to users that's called the ESA thematic exploitation platforms. I provided a link for those. Um, um, they allow users to come in and do some data processing in a shared environment. I'm actually not entirely sure if the exploitation platforms are cloud-based. Uh, or some sort of a supercomputer-based um, environment, um, but they are available. Um, I'm mentioning them because they could be useful for you now, but um, it also would be useful for us if you have experience with these exploitation platforms to hear um, the things that you like about these platforms uh, or don't like about them. Um, so while we are developing uh, our own tools, uh, it's of course useful to understand what works already, uh, how do we fit into the landscape, um, how can we learn from previous efforts? Yeah, so this is Erica. I wanted to add that RSET will be having another advanced SAR training at the end of August, beginning of September. And one of the trainings will uh, show how to use uh, Google Earth Engine um, for um, generating flood products from Sentinel-1 data. So that announcement for that training will be coming out probably at the end of this month, beginning of August. And then Eric, do you have anything to add, Eric Anderson? Sure, thanks. Um, right, I think the um, one of the big advantages of thinking about what Google Earth Engine and similar platforms can involve is this time series analysis. It's it's a whole way of thinking how many 
how, how quickly can we uh, drill through an entire archive of uh, temporal archive of images? Um, I'd say from Serber's perspective, we're in we're in exploratory stages. It's it, it's exciting, and we're um, driven by a lot of questions that that um, need the the entire and need to be addressed by the entire um, time series uh, source of images. So in, in a few initial um, things we've got, uh, Servier often uses a training of trainers approach. Um, our hub in EC mod it, um, that serves the Hindu Kush Himalaya region has a workshop going on right now um, um, focused on educators and practitioners who will, will provide additional trainings in, in countries in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Um, some some demonstrations or um, of combining uh, Sentinel One um, or, or optical ANSAR data um, are are out there in the recent literature it's focused on water body detection. Um, and going back to some of the um, needs and demands from the the Servier Amazonia Hub, we we've started to translate some of the um, SAR handbook materials that were originally written in, in Python um, into a GEE environment, um, noting where there are similarities and differences between the, the two workflows. So a few links there for, for participants. Excellent. So <clears throat> thanks, guys. Um, let's move on to question 23. Um, who wants to take a first stab at question 23? Yeah, Franz, I can I can take a stab and others, um, please feel free to jump in. Um, the question, what is best given between radar images and LIDAR data for the estimation of biomass and carbon in tropical forests? Um, I, the best way for me to answer this is best is in the eye of the beholder. Um, how much uh, resources do we have uh, what is the the study area, and how many times do we need to return to that same area to estimate any changes in in biomass or carbon stocks? Um, so I'll, I'll pull from uh, a few examples. Um, well, first of all, I think if we have um, if we have both data available to us, we should think about using it all. Um, lidar data can help train um, interferometric or coherence based. Um, estimates of above ground biomass or carbon stocks. Um, if we've got resources to fly airborne LIDAR data or even capture ground-based LIDAR, um, then we can get amazing data. Um, some downsides to LIDAR data is that it's often expensive, um, very, uh, even though it's dense, it's um, uh, again very expensive to acquire and, and reacquire. It represents one time period. Um, instead of a repeat. So I like the this specific piece of this question, focusing in tropical forests. Um, if our area is very vast or very cloudy, um, if the biomass and carbon are in great states of flux, if, is there a lot of um, shifting agriculture, forest degradation, or extraction of, uh, of timber, um, radar images may give you more bang for the buck. Um, so uh, Paul C. Kira notes that um, he, in, in his chapter, there are some um, examples of how to calculate forest stand height, which is an important input to biomass. Um, he, he uses a combination of airborne LIDAR and uh, SAR image, uh, radar images um, and notes that once you get to above the hundreds of hectares um, of a study area, LIDAR gets um, uh, prohibitively expensive. Um, the other um, note is uh, just to expand on the combination of the two is, is that there's no universal relationship between um, uh, airborne LIDAR and, and radar images. Um, even though there are global maps um, or continental maps on above ground biomass, it's, um, we do really rely on um, ground data, whether it's airborne LIDAR or um, allometric uh, um, uh, relationships um, from specific forest stands. So a, a long answer to a short question, I would say if you have, if you have both 
think about using both and think about how big your study area is and how frequent how many how, how frequently you need to return to that study area. Does anybody else anybody else have anything to add? Nayara maybe um, or Erica? Well, uh, this is Nayara here, and I would say that uh, with Jedi, the cost may decrease. With the Jedi mission, we might have access to some free data for the first time. Yeah, fantastic point. So uh, watch out for Jedi data. It will come out. It's ex expected to come out in October. They already passed the in-orbit checkout. And uh, so they passed it in March. They should start releasing data in October. If you want to see what the Jedi data look like, you can download some data from the sensor Elvis. And Elvis collected some data in a tropical forest in Costa Rica and Gabon. They have a Python scripts to help you explore the data. There are some small differences uh, from the Jedi instrument, but I think you could look into those uh, scripts and tutorials to hit the ground running when Jedi data is out. Thanks, Nayara. Ex excellent input. Anybody else anything uh, on this topic? It's not the case. Um, maybe um, let's jump to um, <laughs> question 26. Paul Rosen is typing aggressively. All right. Um, oh, sorry. Franz, this is Erica. I was on mute. <laughs> I just wanted to add something about this last question is uh, maybe a good approach forward is to uh, use the LIDAR data to develop confidence in the biomass and carbon stock estimates that can be done with radar data. Just because uh, LIDAR, uh, yes, we have JEDI. However, JEDI is on the International Space Station. It has a limited uh, lifespan. And so when we think of what's going to be available in the future, uh, we're going to be relying on radar data. Uh, especially with uh, upcoming missions like NISAR and biomass. Thanks. <clears throat> Anything else to add? Or if not, then we move on to 26 and I hand it over to Paul Rosen. Okay. Uh, I'm still typing, but I can get started. So, uh, lots of things going on in SAR. Uh, we are kind of at the, we are maybe even beyond the golden age of SAR. We're in the platinum age of SAR right now. Uh, many of you may have heard that there are companies uh, all throughout the world building commercial SAR systems. These are primarily at X-Band because their customer base is largely governments or military. Uh, but Many of these sensors have characteristics that are very well suited to radar remote sensing for scientific purposes. And uh, they will either sell data or offer um, on a limited basis um, uh, data to scientists. And I know that uh, NASA and other space agencies are experimenting with data buy policies rather than building their own satellite satellites. So that's an area that's going to definitely grow and and scientists need to pay attention to that. Just as the optical planet data are becoming more and more used by scientists in conjunction with uh, calibration anchors such as Sentinel-2 and Landsat, I believe that these commercial SARs will be anchored by some of the bigger systems like Sentinel-1, NISAR, and other systems that are coming up. 
and be usable in that context. So that's one thing. Uh, I am fairly certain that uh, beyond NISAR and ALOS, there's going to be a number of additional L-band sensors in the future. ESA is planning a pair of satellites at L-band that would fly in the Sentinel-1 orbit. And DOR is working towards um, a pair of L-band satellites that would be flying together in a tandem configuration like their Tandem X mission. So uh, maybe both of those won't happen, but I suspect at least one of them will. So that's uh, another trend. Uh, Sentinel-1, of course, will be there for the next 30 or 40 years, and there, there are many other C-band sensors from other nations. But beyond the sensors, I'd say that um, we already talked about cloud processing. I think you'll see, given the volumes of data that will be uh, created in the future, you'll see much of the processing going to the cloud rather than transporting these data volumes around. Uh, Missions such as NISAR uh, are producing higher level products than has been typical. Most missions produce the single look complex imagery and then stop at that point. But um, NISAR is producing geocoded single look complex images as well as interferograms and polarimetric products, also geocoded, that should make these data more usable, more user friendly. Um, and lend themselves to yet higher level algorithms that can be developed either by uh, projects or by individual scientists. I think also we've had Sentinel for four years or so now, and um, it's the first time in history that SAR has had a consistent, prevalent, and sort of ubiquitous data set around that's available around the world and available to many people. So I think we're just at the beginning of exploitation of these data sets. Uh, and when NISAR is there and some of these other systems I mentioned, I think you're going to see an explosion of algorithms, explosion of products that are being produced um, that we can all choose from. Uh, and I can imagine uh, uh, projects sponsored by agencies like NASA or even National Science Foundation in the United States where they um, are creating data records uh, on a regional or global scale. Uh, I can imagine these uh, easily happening given what's coming up in the future. So ice sheet maps, forest cover maps, biomass, surface water extent, crop activity surface deformation. I think we're just at the beginning uh, of, uh, of, the, of seeing the true utility of SAR data. That's it for me. Any additions from anybody else? Yeah, I think this is, I mean, SAR is a very exciting uh, topic right now with all the sensors coming up. Um, diversification of sensors, free and open data. Um, there's going to be trends that we know of right now, and there's going to be more trends emerging as time comes along, and people get more and more excited about the data set. Um, any additions? Uh, this is Eric Fielding. I just wanted to re reiterate the Paul's uh, statement that Sentinel-1 was the first uh, fully open access uh, SAR data set with uh, systematic acquisitions. So that was a big uh, change in the, which will be continued with NISAR. In the meantime, I try 
starting to address question 25. Question 25 is, uh, please suggest a resource that deals with the basics of the intricate process of SAR image formation involving uh, the signal processing aspects with programming. Um, so, so basically the question is also also a very beginner resource. So it's, it's various levels um, of sort of uh, papers or book chapters uh, speaking to the process of SAR image formation. Um, I've put in two for now. I'm sure there are plenty more. Um, so there was there's a little bit in the SAR handbook, uh, more on sort of the be beginner's level uh, on, on SAR image formation. There's a, um, a longer paper that came out uh, maybe two years ago um, by Alberto Morera, which was focused sort of on more the non-SAR community, I think, uh, was a tutorial on synthetic, synthetic aperture radar. <clears throat> There's a number of books. Um, Paul, did, did your INSAR paper talk about image formation also? No, not really. It was, um, it was really INSAR. Do you know of any really good, so, uh, I know this, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, <laughs> uh, I, I have just coincidentally been developing a Jupyter notebook that uh, goes through the fundamentals of SAR image formation, starting from a uh, creating synthetic point target uh, signals and doing the SAR processing in an idealized geometry. It's not complete, so I can't give it out yet. It, it still needs some figures and vetting it's, and a few more equations. But within a month or two, it should be ready for distribution. Uh, I learned after putting all this work into it that I think uh, DLR has also created a similar Jupyter notebook already, and it's already was used in a class. I don't know if it's freely available, uh, but in principle, since they've used it for teaching, uh, it should be available at some level. So within a few months, I'd say there will be, I'd say, relatively straightforward beginner's resources. You do need to have a Jupyter Notebook installation and uh, at least some familiarity with Python at, the, at a simple level or MATLAB. It's very MATLAB-like. So, Paul, have you tried that on the OpenSAR lab? I have. It works perfectly. It's, so it is there it. actually. A, a later, an earlier version of what I have now is there on OpenSAR Lab. Somebody added that there's an RSET training um, on the introduction to synthetic aperture radar. Uh, it might have been Erica. Um, so thank you for that. Um, overall, look out. I mean, there's a growing uh, library of open resources. Uh, I pasted one in here in addition to RSET. Um, there's, uh, I maintain a, a web page actually for a class that's called radar.community.uaf.edu. Um, this one has a full semester worth of resources on microwave remote sensing. Uh, so all of these um, uh, slide decks and training materials are available for anybody interested. So you can look around there as well. And there's more like that um, coming along uh, all the time. You could look into also the SAR EDU resources. So I'm gonna I'm gonna paste the link to that as well. We're gonna be wrapping up shortly. Is that correct? It's 12:30 uh, in the morning here in India, so <laughs> I might uh, drop off if we don't. It looks like we are close to, uh, we've addressed most of the questions. Uh, Paul, maybe uh, before you drop off, can you uh, look at question 24 and see if you have a suitable answer for that? We may have to defer that to possibly somebody like uh, Laval. I'm sorry, which question? 24. Oh, the, cal the calibration question? Yeah, I, I would have typed in an answer if I had one. I am not. Uh, I have not done anything really with calibration. I don't think I 
could answer that question without a little bit more thought. <clears throat> the, uh, anybody else? Uh, I don't think we have a calibration person really here. We could we could get that question answered by somebody else um, from maybe the NICER calibration team. Um, yeah. Marco I also don't know what CTLR. I don't know what CTLR mode is. That should be spelled out so that we know what that we know how to answer the question. I can maybe Google that. On the uh, <clears throat> previous question on training, where information on SAR, SAR image formation, uh, let me just. Um, tell you real quick that the European Space Agency together with the University in Germany will be running another massive open online course on radar remote sensing uh, which starts in 60 days I passed uh, the link into I copy pasted the link into the document uh, so if you go there there's a way of enrolling uh, called echoes in space uh, it ran already like two or three years ago once uh, and they do a second run of it um, it's free uh, to enroll and especially if you're a beginner in radar it might be quite useful to uh, sit in at least on some of the lectures there's a question question eight that's not addressed yet <clears throat> while working with pulsar pro I encountered Shannon entropy and entropy as different images. Kindly explain what is the difference between the two. Paul, is that something you can talk about? No, I don't know the difference. So what I can say is I'm assuming uh, not having Pulsar Pro in front of me is that the entropy term relates uh, to the entropy variable that comes out as part of the um, Shane Cloud and Eric Potier developed uh, entropy alpha algorithm. Um, that particular version of entropy basically is a way of um, um, deciding how many dominant scattering mechanisms are present in a particular resolution cell, in a particular SAR pixel. So it, it first um, performs um, a form of eigenvalue decomposition on the data and then compares the eigenvalues to each other to uh, arrive at a conclusion whether there is likely only one dominant scattering mechanism uh, present, like on water it might be just roughness scattering, or in a dense forest it might be mostly um, vegetation type scattering, um, or whether there are multiple um, scattering mechanisms at play. So that's the regular entropy that I know. Shannon entropy I can't say too much about. I think that's a term that comes out of, out of sort of the mutual information type uh, information theory. I will have to, I don't know the details of how that is used in, in SAR. Yeah, I guess there's a similar question posted on the web. Uh, it basically, uh, Pulsar Pro will produce both uh, a Shannon entropy and an entropy estimate. I assume that it's defined someplace in Pulsar Pro, but I haven't used it, so I don't know. It may be in the documentation. If not, uh, the right person to talk to might be Eric Kier, who is the main developer um, behind Pulsar Pro. Yeah, I think Scott Hensley and Marco Lavalle have also contributed to Pulsar Pro along with many others, so perhaps they're a resource. So otherwise I think we got through all the questions. And so, Brooke, do you want to close the session? Yes, thank you very much, everybody. This was a very informative session. And to all the participants, thanks for showing up and asking these great questions.
we are going to make this recording available as well as the document that you've been uh, viewing for the last couple hours. Uh, we're going to make that in a, into a PDF after we do a little bit of cleanup on it and make sure that it looks all nice and neat and that everything is accurate and that all the links work. Um, so uh, look for that on the training webpage in the future. And, um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. And if anybody else has anything they wanted to say, uh, please feel free. And uh, if not, thank you very much for joining us. And we hope that you learned a lot from the panelists on today. Thanks for organizing it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks uh, to all of you for dialing in. Uh, also, Paul, especially uh, after midnight in India. And thanks no for problem. all of you to listen, for listening. Welcome. Thank you.